Hey there, Mick. Uh, it's Rebecca Demir here. Um, it's been some some time now since I've been back at CBU. So I think it was 2008 or nine uh, that I was back in your classroom. Uh, I graduated with a three year undergrad undergrad back then. So back to finish that fourth year, getting ready to challenge my professional designation in my field. So quite excited about that. So good to see you through a screen again. I hope all is well. Um, Excited to be back in the classroom and learn, um, you know, transfer these skills, especially the communication skills to my professional uh, career and what I'm looking to achieve. So being in your classroom is just a bonus. Um, so let's get into it. So uh, not going to lie, this is a little bit repetitive for me by now. I tried to record this three or four times with no success of the volume on my personal computer. So I had to run to work and come home to get this uh, to get this done on a work laptop. So um, here goes nothing. So I wanted to touch fairly quickly besides, you know, my comments on the, the classroom, uh, forum, um, yesterday in regards to the effect of a woman's smile. I thought that was extremely interesting. Um, especially that they used a, a woman over a male. So that would be a question as of why, um, and what the difference would be if the roles were reversed. Uh, additionally, the context was interesting to me. So if it was in a bar versus a library or, um, you know, uh, in a work setting even. Um, and then also what the intention was behind the male's approach to sitting down at the table with the female. So I think that would be interesting. Some people are just truthfully interested in conversation. They're friendly and they want to have that conversation um, versus, you know, if they were in a relationship or if they weren't in a relationship and what they were looking for. So um, I'm a true believer that people are attractive, most attractive when they're in their own element, when they're living in their authenticity and they're doing them, they're, they're doing them. They're vibing, doing their own thing. So whether that's showing up you know, with a smile on and presenting yourself uh, out in public uh, and carrying yourself well and well means different to different people. So that's okay too. But, you know, that can also be somebody hanging out at the lake on a Saturday afternoon, reading a book um, and just truthfully enjoying themselves, which I also find very, uh, a very attractive trait. So I just wanted to add that in there. Uh, I wanted to touch on the, the five C's and the three V's very quickly before I give my uh, examples of my log. So some that I found interesting with regards to context were um, the closed door meeting. I really like that example because what that means in a closed door to touch somebody's arm in an individual meeting versus in a group setting. I think us as Cape Bretoners, we can really relate to that, especially me speaking for myself. Moving to Halifax was a very big, uh, uh, I guess, eye-opening experience. Not everybody wants to be touched. We're natural touchers, rub shoulders, slap hands, slap arms, um, talk with our hands. We're big. You know, our hospitable hugs when we see each other. Um, not everybody wants that. Not everybody's open to that, and that's okay. So how that message comes across may differ from, you know, seeing somebody that knows somebody else's father that you just met in Cape Breton versus doing that in, you know, another part of the world sometimes differs and by individual as well. Uh, cluster demeanor. I think this one is absolutely huge for me in my professional career, how I come off um, to an audience. I do occupational health and safety for a living and I often train um, folks I train in big groups. I train individual one-on-one, -on -one, train the trainer, and I'm in front of audiences. So how I come off as a trainer to be open communication, to make lots of eye contact, to engage the audience and ask for participation, for understanding. Um, I think that demeanor piece is huge uh, to involve everybody in that conversation. So um, really listening or seeing what that listener is giving back to me uh, and how I can change my approach and adjust, adjust my approach to um, maybe who's in front of me. Uh, congruence. There was a Netflix show recently released. It was called um, The Ultimatum Queer Love. Great show, by the way. It's great to see some queer representation uh, 
on such a big scale. So uh, FYI. <clears throat> but other than that, there was this girl on there and she was absolutely incredible at vocalizing her emotions to um, her partner. It almost made it like easy to understand how she was feeling because sometimes we overcomplicate our emotions when we're trying to vocalize that. But she made it really easy. But she didn't get famous for that. She got famous for her facial reactions while she was in a group setting, maybe full of drama, or even just participating in conversations in groups where the camera would almost shoot right across to her because they knew she was going to have a reaction. So um, that's what I can think about when I think about congruence. Consistency. I'm going to give an example about my personal life um, and relationship. I guess the consistency and pattern that I have always showed in previous relationships was to say, yep, yeah, sure, everything's good. Yep, I agree. And walk out the door and have my body language already out of the conversation before the conversation was done. So thankfully, I've been working on that and I'm a lot better at it. I stay in those uncomfortable conversations and make sure that, you know, my body language and what I'm giving off is not um, going to cause a secondary fight as a result. So the three B's, verbal, visual, and vocal. Um, <clears throat> again, personal life, uh, vocal, how we vocalize things. I'm fine. Or, yeah, I'll get that report done. Um and how that comes across to the other person participating in the conversation. So I wanted to touch on my logs um, a little bit. Uh, like I mentioned, I'm in occupational health and safety. I have a couple different locations that I manage and um, I have the opportunity to observe the trainer provide training to um, new hires or a new you know, a new task, new learners. So it's really interesting as I see their demeanor um, in the context in which they're teaching in. So work in uh, waste management and, and hauling as well and like trans, you know, landfills, uh, transfer stations, uh, stuff like that. So um, a lot of uh, blue collar, cis male, gender, Caucasian, average age, I believe is 47 a lot of different type of learners in the room, a lot of different uh, uh, techniques that I think are important to use. So classroom setting versus hands-on learning. I think there's so many different ways where we can communicate. You know, some people understand facts and data. Some people connect through shared experiences, through emotional connection, through um, all kinds of different learning techniques. So I recently trained a gentleman um, he had 20 years experience doing the labor part and he got hurt at work and he wanted to come over to the health and safety side to be in the classroom and talk about his experience and do like the legal and ethical obligations of health and safety in the workplace. So I trained him and I'm not certain if it was the jitters of, you know, having, you know, his first time training in front of people in a classroom. That wasn't his context in which he was comfortable in. He's comfortable in the field using his hands. Um, if it was me, uh, his boss, observing him uh, provide training, or he wasn't comfortable with uh, the uh, curriculum. So um, his demeanor showed that he was, you know, kind of slunched over. He was standing in the classroom. His papers were close. His eyes were continually to the back, uh, to the PowerPoint presentation rather than in front. And... Uh, and making sure that people, he was getting engagement that way. Um, he was talking quick. He did not take pauses. He was talking almost low where people were having side conversations and aside. So, you know, me from observing this, um, thankfully I was able to interrupt him um, and ask him to share a story that was applicable to what uh, he was talking about at the time. I knew that he had an experience that was near to dear and near and dear to him where he was able to, first of all, stop and collect himself, take a breath, breathe in, get, let some of those jitters go. But secondly, he was able to talk about something that he was extremely confident and comfortable talking about. 
So um, people will only believe the, the message if they believe the messenger. So they were able to really, the audience was really able to connect with them in that moment because they could make it applicable that he was talking about something um, and his body language changed almost immediately. His eyes came up. He was making contact with folks. He was saying, if you do this, please don't, because this is my experience. Um, he was no longer staring at the board behind him. And he was able to continue on training with a new level of confidence, which speaks for itself, especially um, you know, through that body language piece. Um, additionally, I have another trainer who provides more of the hands-on training piece. Uh, he has years and years of experience. It's in his element. He teaches me more than I could ever teach him. Um, he's extremely knowledgeable, but not only that, he's an incredible presenter. So he, this setting was outside and it was around a truck and it was to do with a, a pre-trip inspection, which isn't relevant to this, but it was hands-on. So again, we have that blue collar type uh, of workforce where they're here to do that type of job. So the classroom isn't necessarily their element. I'm not going to lie. It's not exciting for them, but it's, uh, so they're out in the yard and they're doing um, an inspection. So first of all, what the uh, manager was able to do in that situation was he was able to visually show up and present himself how he wanted the workers to visually show up and present themselves with the high, uh, high vis PPE, with the steel toe boots, um, uh, and so on and so forth. So that was number one. They were able to see and recognize that. Secondly, he asked everybody to come a little bit closer so he didn't have to completely yell and, uh, and lose the message and, I guess, the vocalization of how his message, how he wanted his message to come across. So he asked everybody to come in closer and if everybody could hear him at this, you know, at this level and at this tone. Uh, so he asked for engagement, which is also very important. He did a walk around of the vehicle. And then as we kind of started to get through the day and the different job tasks from driving to landfill, he got the, the audience and the participants in that training course to raise their hand if they were hired for that job role. What he was then able to do is make it more applicable by making eye contact with those certain people more frequently rather than the whole pool of people. So he was able to direct his attention more appropriately based on the job task and make that connection of, okay, this is, you know, um, how you need to perform an inspection. This is the, you know, electrical panel, whatever the training curriculum was, was going over. Um, additionally, he made it interesting for everybody in that way because he almost made it personable. So when he would get down on one knee to show the drivers what to do underneath the truck uh, for an inspection purpose, everybody got on one knee to look underneath the truck. So I was really able to recognize and witness the difference in, in teaching and how the setting matters and how the demeanor truthfully does matter and how the request for participation matters as well. So that was kind of my first log. Uh, secondly, I focused on, um, again, this was, a, I was in the audience this time. I was able to participate in a Art of Leadership for Women conference in Toronto, um, uh, the end of June. And there were incredible women there. There was 3,500 people in the audience who were there to listen to some incredible women in the workplace um, the struggles they go through, you know, their accolades, their um, things that they were able to achieve. Um, and they all talked on different to topics. One was about uh, diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging. And it was from this uh, woman who came out in her uh, traditional Indian, um, her Indian attire. And it was very humbling to listen to her experience for one, but she showed up authentic and true to herself. And that is just being the visual representation without even having to say it. So I really enjoyed that. 
Secondly, there was a uh, lady that discussed the importance of negotiation as a woman in the workplace. So what I did take away from that was how to negotiate. And sometimes that best negotiation is coming from the nonverbal cues that we are giving. So ask the person sitting across the table to talk without even having to ask that question uh, first. So, um, and more or less the importance of, of what I guess I'm trying to make is the audience miss as well. So how those women worked the room, walking back and forth across the stage at a calm pace, uh, you know, they're not racing back and forth where your neck was continually moving. Um, but how they were able to work the stage for 3,500 people and look to the back and, you know, ask for the people in the back to stand up and cheer. So they really got them involved. Finally, the keynote speakers were Haley Recognizer. Go Haley, uh, a, tw- a four-time uh, Canadian gold medalist, uh, Team Canada, 23 years, medical doctor, <clears throat> in Toronto's ER and uh, Toronto Maple Leafs um, trainer. Uh, Not many people are like her, incredible. But what was also incredible was we're at a conference with professional women who have buttoned up shirts on, collared shirts, dresses, skirts, pants, pantsuits, you know, heels. And Haley walks out as her true authentic self in a Canadian sweater, red and white with Canada across, you know, that's how we know her. Um, That's how she represented herself, her brand, who she was. And she was able to use a pace and use the stage, which again engaged the audience. And people were able to feel so connected and vulnerable and that's vulnerable in that space where some of us cried. You know, I watched some women shed some tears and wave them away as she's telling uh, some some stories about her past. Then also how she wrapped everything all in one. And the feeling that we all had in that room um, was was quite incredible. She's very funny as well. So um, how she was able to tell dry humor jokes and have a pause, wait for the audience to laugh and then laugh with us. So uh, those moments were, you know, they spoke volumes, being in that room, feeling that motivation with other women as well. So I think the context of what we're all there for, for the purpose was, um, was incredible. Finally, the last speaker of the day was Lisa Laflemme, CTV uh, national chief uh, news anchor, Um, I should say former CTV anchor um, who was released for um, moving in another direction, we'll say. Um, She was unbelievable. Her storytelling was impeccable. And it was an interviewer that was asking her questions. They asked a couple of questions and then they took questions from the audience that were submitted online. Um, They were facing each other but they had enough space to um, also face the audience partially. So I think witnessing that conversation between the interviewer and how the interviewer asked the question and Lisa almost being compliant and showing understanding with head nods and keeping eye contact while there's 3,500 people watching, she was showing interest in the interviewer and it almost made it feel... <clears throat> really intimate as if I was just there myself listening where she gave the respect to the interviewer to have a conversation with the interviewer, but then she would turn her body to face the audience and continue a story, but make it relatable to us. So I really appreciated that. Um, And then not only that, going back to her storytelling where she would change her facial expression to show a lot of excitement about talking about the incredible people that she had the opportunity to interview over her course of her career. And then some of the toughest moments as well. Um, She talked about the experience of interviewing the Beatles and, and going over to England and her excitement and joy of her smile 
you can almost feel that energy. And then she talked about the the sadness of being at ground zero during 9-11. And again, you could feel that coming from her because of her tone, because of the way she was able to vocalize, the pauses she was able to take, the uh, direction of her eyes in which making con- you know contact with her, the audience, but then taking a moment to pause and look down, being reflective. So... Um, witnessing that and again being the person in that audience and also feeling that energy around me and watching these women take in this moment um, with me was pretty incredible to watch to witness and to feel so um, they were some of the logs that I was able to um, keep track of and I'm almost fairly happy that I was able to read that this assignment before before going there because I was even more aware of, of those things. Um, to wrap this up, uh, we're getting a little bit lengthy here, but to wrap this up, I think that, you know, the article expressing that communication is really only 7% vocal, um, definitely starting to see and understand that uh, there's a whole lot more to communication than just chit chatting. So, Um, that's it for assignment one and, uh, looking forward to learning more. Thank you.